um, to the next Journal Club meeting. Um, we are so excited uh, for everyone here. We're so excited for this presentation as well. I think it's gonna be really good. Um, my name is Hannah. I'm part of the leadership who helps run um, the Journal Club and there's a smattering of other folks online as well who are also in charge. Um, if you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to use the chat feature throughout this presentation and um, our presenters will be able to uh, address those questions or uh, maybe our faculty advisor might help out with answering those questions. But um, without further ado, I will turn it over to Vraj and Brendan who are going to present on vertebroplasty tonight. So thank you guys so much for being our presenters. Thank you, Hannah. It's really a privilege to be here. I had a lot of fun uh, preparing. So I hope you guys also have a lot of fun. And for everyone watching the recording, I hope this is a very educational experience for everyone. Uh, Vraj, you wanna say a couple words? Yep, uh, just like Brendan, it was honestly a really good learning experience. Um, I will say I didn't really know too much about vertebroplasty before starting this endeavor. So just to plug out this whole initiative, if anyone uh, wants to present something in the future, it's definitely a great learning opportunity. I learned so much throughout this whole process. Um, and without further ado, we'll get into the presentation. Uh, there are going to be points in this presentation where we're going to ask you guys to interact a little bit. Uh, and the software we're using this time for that is Pull Everywhere. So as you can see at the bottom of the slide, it's just uh, ways to get um, into the Pull Everywhere software for this presentation. You can either use the website at the link provided, or if you have your phones out, you can uh, text that uh, short phrase, Patel Vraj 20. Uh, two, 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 zero to that number and you'll join. And whenever we have a question for you, you can participate with along with us. Yeah, and before we begin, when it, as everyone's kind of joining into the poll everywhere, I just wanted to thank Dr. Drew Kaplan. He is an attending uh, interventional radiologist as long as the program director of the interventional radiology program at Northwell. We are, he's actually the first attending that I get to, got to see any sort of vertebral augmentation. So it really has a special place in my heart and I would really, really appreciate his expertise and his insight on vertebroplasty. So we wanted to thank Dr. Drew Kaplan and let's get started. So a quick overview about this whole, uh, how this whole presentation is gonna work. Uh, we'll first quickly talk you guys through a case about like how a normal vertebroplasty patient would present with, um, and then talk a little bit about pathophysiology associated with the conditions related to uh, uh, vertebroplasty patients. Uh, we'll also then talk about a little bit about the details and the other clinical aspects of um, patients who undergo this procedure before we finally get into the two trials that we're gonna be discussing for this journal club. So uh, here's the case presentation. Uh, this patient is a 78-year-old woman who presents to the clinic with an acute onset of severe pain in her left leg and back. The pain is approximately 7 out of 10 in uh, severity and is described as shooting from her back to her left leg. She has uh, a medical history of SLE and is medically managed, and surgical history includes a C-section in 1990, uh, 1981. Medication history includes uh, glucocorticoids and methotrexate. Patient has a 40 pack year smoking history and consumes alcohol socially. On um, physical examination of her left knee, extension strength is two out of five, and her left patellar reflex is three plus, uh, plus three. All other parts of the examination were relatively normal. So, based off that presentation, we'll get into the first sort of interactive part. What parts of that history sort of stood out important to you? So, I'll just give you guys a few minutes to respond to this and just anything that stuck out in your mind that would have helped you uh, guide your clinical reasoning. I think you guys might have to make the poll active. It looks like it's it's on a waiting screen for participants. Huh. Is it active now? Not for me. I don't know if anybody else um, has it active, but it still says it's waiting for the presentation to begin. 
It's not active yet for me. Okay, okay. a couple other me, people. Yeah. Give me one second. Yeah, it was working right before. So as I feel like if we restart the presentation, we should be fine. Yeah, that's all I'm trying to do. Okay. Can everyone see my screen again? Yeah, now it opened up. Okay. Awesome, we see a lot of good parts of the history that are being presented. Awesome. So the bigger the word means that more people have been inputting. So like smoking is the popular part that's sticking out. We have mm -hmm. glucocorticoids, which are part of medication, uh, the exam, age, uh, lupus, so her medical history, fact that she's female so her sex right and her physical exam so her reflexes okay, okay i think we're good to move on yep so i think all of you guys basically like through all the responses we hit on basically everything that was important to us um her age and the fact that she's a woman uh the fact that her pain was described as shooting and is uh radiating basically to her left leg uh, her medication history of glucocorticoids and her 40 year, uh, 40 pack year smoking history, as well as her reflex and extension strengths. So those are the important parts that for this case to keep in mind. So with those parts in mind, what conditions appear on your differential diagnosis? Great. Also, so, we see a lot of stenosis, fractures, um, osteoporosis, degenerative lumbar disease, metastasis. Mm -hmm. Just general nerve damage. Great. So that's uh, looking at the big words, basically, that's almost exactly what we were looking for. In this case, specifically, um, it is a type of fracture, and we can see this very, very clearly in imaging. Um, so uh, here we have on the top two images are a CT and the bottom two images are an MRI. And we can clearly see that one of the vertebrae is, you know, quote unquote, not normal. It's bulging out and it's uh, distended and impinging on the uh, spinal canal and nerve root endings. Uh, this type of fracture is called a burst fracture, uh, basically meaning that the spine has been, uh, the uh, vertebrae has been broken in uh, multiple parts and is actually uh, sort of bursted out and opened up into different spaces, not just localized into the one area that um, it normally is in. So with that, uh, we go and do a little bit more of diagnostic workup. Um, so we run a DEXA scan, which is a scan for bone density. And the way that it is um, sort of used is comparing the normal bone, de uh, the patient's bone density to a patient or an average patient uh, that is 30 years old of the same sex as the patient that you have. And in this case, the patient uh, is 2.7 standard deviations uh, lower than the normal bone density of that 
30 year old healthy female. Uh, we also draw a bunch of labs and we had some people hint at this before, but what sort of underlying conditions would you be uh, concerned about for a patient with a vertebral fracture like this? And in case people were wondering, the labs were supposed to be all within normal limits. Okay, so honestly, great. Um, the big word that we see uh, sticking out is osteoporosis. Someone had, I guess, jumped the gun a little bit in the previous poll everywhere and mentioned osteoporosis there as well. But that is something that we should be concerned about in this patient as well. Um, all the other answers are obviously something that you should also be concerned about and like definitely check out. But what uh, this patient actually is uh, in fact have osteoporosis. So let's just talk a little bit about uh, osteoporosis and like how exactly does this, that make this a risk factor for uh, this patient? So in terms of osteoporosis, the most common patients that you'll see in, uh, with this condition are females that are older, around 50 to 70. And the reason why uh, 50 to 70 and older uh, is because they mostly have gone through menopause. Um, and the, uh, this is just one, just one of the major risk factors for osteoporosis. There are a couple of risk factors. So uh, like we mentioned, uh, post-menopause osteoporosis is uh, one of the most common osteoporosis uh, patients that you'll see. And the reason for this is just the uh, fact that estrogen has a protective role on bone health. So once a patient goes through menopause, they start uh, stop producing estrogen at, at the same levels as they once did, and therefore, um, lose that protective uh, nature of estrogen uh, on their bone health. There's also the senile osteoporosis, osteoporosis that happens as you get older. And it's uh, essentially just a gradual loss of bone mass. So on top of um, the uh, protective nature of estrogen not being there, the complicating factor of age also plays a part into these female patients. You can also have other risk factors uh, that are not exactly related to age or sex, uh, including medication use, so specifically uh, corticosteroids, which is why the glu uh, glucocorticoids use uh, for this patient is particularly of note. Uh, the reason for this is that, um, you know, the, the steroids often have, uh, you know, sort of like uh, unintended effects and uh, plays a role in a specific pathway, specifically the uh, rank L uh, rank pathway. Um, and similarly, in terms of a whole bunch of different uh, endocrine uh, conditions, we'll see very similar things. Uh, a lot of these hormones play uh, significant roles in these pathways that uh, sort of regulate bone remodeling and bone density and bone retention. Other risk factors uh, that uh, could, uh, you could also look at, cigarette smoking. Cigarette smoking is known to have uh, similar effects uh, is to some of the endocrine uh, conditions that we uh, just basically talked about a little bit, as well as have an impact on how well your body is able to absorb calcium and vitamin D. So when you are smoking cigarettes, you're not getting the uh, calcium and vitamin D that you need for proper bone health and proper bone remodeling and regeneration. Uh, along that similar uh, note, malnutrition, if you're not just eating enough calcium or vitamin D, you can also lead to osteoporosis and loss of overall bone density. So, ooh, for some reason this came up really blurry. Um, but the um, um, most important takeaway here is just the protective aspect of estrogen. Estrogen uh, works on basically all levels of uh, bone remodeling at the uh, level of osteocytes, osteoblasts, and osteoclasts. We, we remember back all the way for, uh, to our preclinical years when we were first learning about this. Um, 
we know that osteocytes are essentially the long living uh, bone cells, the ones that actually make up the majority of the bone that uh, you will see. And estrogen has this protective aspect of it. So you, it reduces apoptosis of those osteocytes. This essentially just allows you to keep much of the bone mass that you have. It also has a protective aspect of on osteoblasts, which are the uh, cells that actually make new bone. So uh, the production of bone is protected, as well as having a uh, negative influence on osteoclasts. So they increase the, pro uh, the apoptosis of osteoclasts in this case, um, which are responsible for uh, bone destruction and bone reabsorption. So if you don't have as much uh, estrogen, you basically hit on all three areas of uh, your bone density. Awesome, thank you, Raj. So we're gonna be transitioning to the more procedural clinical aspects of osteoporosis and the treatments of osteoporotic vertebral fractures, which is vertebroplasty. So next <laughs> slide, please. Next slide, yep, perfect. So vertebroplasty in essence is just injecting this sort of cement called polymethyl methacrylate PMMA into the diseased part of the vertebral body. So there are three main reasons why this vertebral body will be diseased and more prone to fracture. And we talked about this a little bit before, but the main reason would be osteoporosis. So the osteoporotic vertebral body would fracture. And if they are refractory to medical or surgical therapy and the pain is still consistent, then vertebroplasty could be a great, great option for these patients. Also vertebral hemangiomas. So this is basically kind of tumor of the, uh, the blood vessels within the vertebral area that feeds the vertebral bodies. And it could also be due to vertebral lesions secondary to primary or metastatic tumors. So a quick question, which type of tumor is most commonly metastasizing to the vertebral body? And this isn't going to be a poll everywhere. Anybody can either write in the chat. Feel free to unmute yourself and just answer. No wrong answers. Prostate. Prostate for men. What about for women? Breast cancer. Breast. Awesome. Thank you. And another quick question. <laughs> On this slide right here, we see an image of a vertebral body CT scan. What is this representing? This is just a fun teaching point for everyone. Some may say it's a polka dot appearance or salt and pepper. It's a one out of three. It's, 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 one, it's one of the causes of vertebral factors. So it's one of the three options right here. I'll guess prostate. <laughs> No, I meant um, like what sort of pathology is the vertebral body representing? Like the image. A lytic lesion? Yeah. yeah, so this is actually a vertebral hemangioma. I had no idea. I only know this because I looked it up. Um, but it appears as like a more salt and pepper, like polka dot appearance in the vertebral body. And a fun fact is vertebroplasty was first developed or first indicated for vertebral hemangiomas. So that was just like a fun, interesting point that I wanted to go over. Uh, next slide, please. So in order to understand how vertebral plastic works, we have to know the anatomy. So this is the anatomy of a very, very you know, normal. Sorry, oh, Dr. Arube joined us. Uh, Dr. Arube is also one of Northwell's IR attendings. Um, so a quick question here. Which level of the vertebrae would this level represent? Their cervical, thoracic, and lumbar, and I guess sacral. Can anybody take a uh, stab at it? This has to be thoracic. Why would you say that? Uh, I was thinking, does it have like the facets in order to kind of match with the ribs? Okay. Um, and Ivan, I hope I'm saying, is it Ivan? Yes. Um, well, it says lumbar. Yeah. I need some points back at Joseph. Um, so 
I actually don't see the the facets and the other thing is the the articular process it's sort of like facing anteriorly well I think at the thoracic level it was more like horizontal awesome yeah those are great points so this actually is the lumbar region so what it's a lot easier if you have them lined up and then we can kind of go up through down but the lumbar region of the vert vertebrae has a much, much bigger vertebral body. And that's to kind of support the weight bearing aspects of like the function of the vertebrae. So since it's lower, it's going to have a much, much larger vertebral body to be able to stabilize and support the spinal cord. And like Ivan said, we technically don't see the, um, the outlets to the rib. So that's another way to tell that this isn't really a thoracic. Uh, next slide, please. So another quick question. This is a part that's not labeled in this slide. The nice blue orange. What, I guess, I don't want to say structure, but what area is that? And I promise this will be relevant. Quick hint is that it's a foramen. So this is the intervertebral foramen. And it's important because what runs through this foramen, can anybody take a stab at it? If the vertebral foramen is encasing the spinal cord, what will shoot out through the inner vertebral foramen? Nerve roots. Nerve roots, perfect. So we definitely don't want to hit these nerve roots as you're in kind of finding the fractured area. So uh, next slide, please. When we do vertebroplasty, it's critical that you go through the pedicle. And that's going to ensure that you're not going to be hitting any arteries or any nerves around that area. So when we guide through and slowly insert the needle, we have to make sure that we're going through the uh, pedicle and entering the vertebral body. Any questions? Perfect, next slide, please. So this is kind of what you'll be seeing in the fluoroscopy Andrew Suite uh, room when we're doing vertebral plasty. A, represents an AP view, B represents a more medial lateral view. And you can see that bilaterally, you see the two needles coming in in the AP view and filling it up with cement. So all that dark kind of space that's filled up is a cement that's filling up the fractured or diseased vertebrae. So ideally, when we see it in a medial lateral view, you want those two to be exactly lined up. So it just looks like there's only one needle going in. Next slide, please. And this is a quick video that we're going to be watching. All this is is just a basic animation of a vertebroplasty. Sometimes just seeing things in 3D make it a little bit more sense than seeing everything in just 2D, which is why we included this. So we see the needles are placed right through the pedicle, all through the meat of the lamina and into the fractured vertebrae. And right now they're kind of inserting their needle into the fractured area and then they're injecting the cement. So there are a couple of theories of why this cement is helping with pain. So the first theory is that it's just, just pure mechanical stabilization of the fractured bone. So it kind of decompresses any stenosis or compressed area of the spinal cord. There's also a theory that there's thermal destruction of the nerve endings because once the cement hardened, there's a lot of, it's gonna be in a high temperature, high energy state. Uh, when during the polymerization, I'm not a material scientist, so I can't exactly explain, but once the cement hardens, there's a lot of just energy and heat that's um, exuded into the uh, vicinity. 
There's also a theory that there's chemical destruction of the nerve endings um, due to just like the chemical composition of the cement. So those three are kind of the big theories that potentially explain why there's pain relief. And just a fun fact, in the United States in 2003, there were around 25,000 vertebroplasty procedures that were paid for by Medicare. So this is the lowest, at least 25,000. And as of 2011, 2012, this number is around 70 to 100,000 cases. So it's a three to four fold increase in 10 years. And I'm not too sure of what the statistics are now, um, but I'm sure it's growing and growing. Next slide, please. Yep. So the general post-op and follow-up the beauty of interventional minimally invasive procedures, it's not too complicated, uh, the post-op and follow-up management. So for vertebroplasty, we basically observe the patient for around one to three years, uh, one to three hours after surgery in the PACU. Um, local tenderness just from the needle and bruising can be common post-operative concerns or complaints, but these can be managed through analgesic therapy and just ad adjusting the do dose accordingly is critical for uh, post-op patient care. And normally for follow-up, there's one day, one week, one month, and up to six months of post-procedure -proce follow-up just to make sure to manage the pain levels and just to see how the progression of the pain is going. And at these follow-ups, a lot of the dose adjustments of the narcotics or analgesic therapy can be made. And additional post-operative -oper imaging is really not that necessary unless the patient really has not responded to the treatment or if there are any signs of complications, which I'll be talking about in a little bit. Next slide, please. So this is the final post-op. Uh, so you do get a post-op right after, a post-op CT right after. And this is the case of a successful vertebroplasty. So you see the cement not really leaking, enclosed in the diseased fractured uh, vertebral body in a both uh, sagittal and axial view. Next, please. And these are the quick contraindications and complications. It's pretty intuitive. So the contraindications would be if there is symptom improvement with conservative management. So just with analgesic uh, medication, if there is symptom improvement, uh, the literature says it's vertebral position is not really recommended. If there's any signs of septicemia, if there's unmanageable coagulopathy. So these are general contraindications for any sort of procedure. There's also, if there's active osteomyelitis in that target vertebrae, that's also a huge contraindication. This can potentially spread um, the infection. So highly um, not recommended. And if there's any allergy to bone cement or the pacification agents, this is also self-explanatory, it will be contraindicated. And potential complications, we're gonna be diving a little bit more into this in the following slides, but from the actual procedure, you could get effect, infection, fracture of the sternum of the ribs, or the transverse process, if the insertion of the needle isn't too careful, um, any of the anesthetics used, even though it, it is very light uh, anesthesia, it can be causing respiratory distress, Bleeding or infection comes with any procedure and damage to the nerve roots outside of like the pain nerve roots could be a complication. And just from the cement, this is the part that we're gonna be diving in a little bit more. The cement can embolize through the venous system and lead to a pulmonary embolism. So there has been case report, there have been case reports that actually reported this. And there could be new fractures just into the neighboring vertebrae um, and thermal damage to the surrounding tissue outside of the nerve roots responsible for pain could be complications. So let's get to the fun part. Next slide, please. We see, what do we see here? These could be normal. It could be a complication. So just try to think of something and just try to back it up. And if I give you a hint, this is after cement injection. I can take a whack at it, Brendan. I think it's a complication. Yeah, I think it's superior extract. 
maybe. Awesome. So this is some extravasation to the actual uh, disc. So yeah, you can kind of see, uh, Raj, can you kind of point it for us? Like you can see the extravasation into, yeah, into the disc area. Uh, uh, next slide, please. What about this one? Extravasation into the retroperitoneal space. If I were to, so the ex extravasation looks a little bit too linear. Hmm. And it seems to be enclosed. So if I were to give you those hints, where would the cement be kind of leaking into? It's like going into a vestal or something of that sort. Yeah, so it's going into the vertebral vein. So this is a venous. So these sort of extravasation can potentially cause the pulmonary embolus. Uh, next slide, please. What about this guy? It looks like it's extraving into the spinal canal. Yeah, exactly. So this is kind of going into the epidural space. Uh, next slide, please. And this one is this. I'm pretty sure this is the last slide uh, in terms of complications. If I give you a hint, there may be repeats. This one is a little bit tricky. So when we see which part is, where do you see the cement? So you kind of see it surrounding the vertebral body and kind of smack in the middle. So this is unusual because this area is actually the disc space, which is why you don't see a general spread or like the actual filling of the fracture. You see only a tiny kind of extravasation in the middle of the vertebral. Well, if you look at it topically, it looks like it's in the middle of the vertebral body. But if you look at it from a cranial caudal level, it's going to be in the disc space. So next slide, please, or next slide. So this is a really, really nice just diagram kind of explaining the different types of leaks and extravasation. We went through a lot of them. Um, so we have the epidural space leak, the venous leak, and the discal leak, which are the big ones. And you, of course, have the paravertebral leak. Next slide, please. So we're going to be going into the trials. It's going to be pretty interesting since we do have two articles and the two articles are kind of going against uh, each other. So one, the Vertos 4 trial is basically saying we don't see any improvement in pain reduction, pain relief compared to uh, placebo. And for the vapor trial, they're saying they do see a lot more pain relief with vertebral plasty. So those two are the general big ideas of what they're are kind of arguing for. So next slide, please. And I think Braj will be taking over this. Yep, so I'll just guide you guys through a little bit of the general aspects of these two trials. Um, if you guys have been to uh, some of the other um, like journal club meetings, uh, we're not gonna be talking about as much in detail about um, the individual aspects since we're gonna be focusing on comparing and contrasting the two of them. So the vapor trial was an RCT and it was a, uh, what they called a multi-center study because they looked at uh, these cases in four different hospitals in Sydney. And the main goal of this uh, vapor trial was to um, detail the effects of vertebroplasty on fractures that were less than six weeks old. The reason for this is that there were previous uh, vertebroplasty trials done uh, prior to the vapor trial. Um, however, they didn't uh, show too much uh, benefit uh, prior to the vapor, but uh, the uh, team at the, uh, that did the vapor trial uh, noticed that if you do uh, vertebroplasty a little bit earlier on, so uh, when the fractures are relatively newer, uh, you actually do get to see some uh, greater benefits than if you wait a longer period of time. And these sort of effects weren't really categorized very, very well. So that was the goal of this vapor trial. 
So uh, one thing of note that I want to point out in this, uh, the whole uh, inclusion exclusion diagram that I'm almost all uh, RCTs uh, show inside of their published data um, is that they call themselves a multi-center uh, trial because of four hospitals. But if we look at it um, a little bit more close, closely, a lot of the cases are focused right in into one center and very few cases in the other uh, few, uh, other three centers. In fact, in uh, the placebo intervention, uh, none from center four were even done were, and only one of them in the actual ones that were assigned to the vertebroplasty intervention. So in terms of the Vertos 4 trial, this came a little bit later than uh, the Vapor trial. Uh, and there were other Vertos trials done. Those were some of the previous um, uh, vertebroplasty trials that I was referring to when uh, talking about uh, the Vapor trial. Uh, in this case, it is also a RCT that was a multi-center looking at, again, four different hospitals, but this time in the Netherlands. And uh, it was supposed to be a direct follow-up to the Vertos true two trial, uh, one, the predecessor of the Ver uh, this Veritas 4 trial, as well as the Vapor trials, and actually directly calls them out in the ending of the dis uh, introduction, where they talk about why their study uh, is different and the goals of their study is different than other previous trials. And they say that they want to improve on the limitations of the 2009 trials by using stricter inclusion and exclusion criteria, larger patient cohorts, longer clinical and imaging follow-up, and no crossover. And we see overall that they do do this fairly well. Um, the uh, overall sample sizes for both uh, vertebroplasty and sham intervention are uh, relatively, uh, are both larger almost by 50% um, in some cases, uh, some cases compared to the vapor trials. And, and they do do a much better job of following up over a long period of time compared to the vapor trial. So uh, again, one thing to note, uh, in this uh, sort of diagram that stood out to us at least, uh, was the fact of how many patients they actually uh, assessed for eligibility. Uh, you see that the end for this is over 1,000, 1,280 uh, for, in contrast, uh, the vapor trial was only in the, uh, like a couple hundred, like three or 400. So much, much larger patients, I guess, at least screened. Uh, however, not many actually made it through the screening. A lot of the uh, inclusion criteria, including age and uh, age of fractures and things along those nature, um, actually didn't meet the trial. So this is not like an overall objective um, study for looking at basically every single vertebroplasty done at these four centers. Uh, this is looking at actually a very, very small subset of vertebroplasties done at these centers. So just something important to note. Now to understand um, these studies, you have to understand pain scales and just pain in general, because pain reduction is the overall goal of uh, vertebroplasty in these patients. Uh, we want to uh, reduce their discomfort. And there are two major types of pain scales that are looked at inside of these studies. The visual analog scale looked in vertus and the numerical rating scale or the NRS scale that was looked at in the vapor. Uh, you might have seen these in the uh, different in a clinical setting, but uh, the NRS scale uh, is the one that's generally used more often in pain-related uh, research studies. Uh, however, clinically, with the, both the visual analog scale and the NRS scale are both uh, useful measures. The biggest difference uh, between the two is you're assigning a number in the uh, NRS scale uh, where you see the one through 10 demarked. Uh, in the visual analog scale, the patient is basically just asked to point to where along the line uh, they feel that their pain is. Uh, and then just the distance, I guess, is sort of uh, looked at of like, you know, oh, they pointed to a point 81 millimeters down the um, uh, scale. And in general, this is kept to around 100 millimeters uh, in length. So here we're just comparing the baseline characteristics of the study cohort. A couple of interesting points that we found when we were comparing. So the left is the Vertos 4 trial and the right is the Vapor trial. A couple of things that we found that were interesting were one for the Vapor trial. So on the table on the right, for the duration of fracture, like 
uh, Raj mentioned, they actually wanted to see within the six weeks. They even stratified that into the one to three weeks of uh, since fracture and four to six weeks since fracture. But when we look at the Vertos trial, they just give us a median number of days with back pain before procedure and a median number of days from radiographic diagnosis to procedure. So this really doesn't give us the full picture of how their patient population or their patient population uh, was kind of distributed in terms of how many days since the fracture they had the procedure. Another interesting point that I also found, that we also found, was that their use for the Vertos trial between vertebroplasty and the sham procedure, you do see a pretty stark difference in the amount of opioid usage in the vertebroplasty group and the sham procedure group. So if you specifically look at the strong opioid derivatives, there's around 47% of the patient population assigned to the vertebroplasty group, um, while there's only 29% of the uh, patient population that were assigned to the sham procedure using strong opioid derivatives. So that I thought was like a pretty interesting point uh, for the Vertos trial. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just how we grade fractures. Um, it's called, I'm pretty sure it's the Genant or Genant grades. There's one to three, uh, and this is just a breakdown. So there's mild, moderate, severe, uh, pretty similar to one, two, and three. And we see the distribution of like the patient population. Did you have anything else to add, Raj? Yep. So I guess like the, uh, some of the things that we're, um, we're like pulling out this way is just so you can look at it a little bit more clearly comparing the two studies. And we actually see that there is a much higher proportion of um, grade three or severe fractures um, seen in the vapor trial compared to the um, uh, Veritos 4 trial. So that was just something that we wanted to point out. Almost you know, two thirds to three fourths of the cases, depending on uh, what side of the population you're looking at, either placebo or the actual um, getting the actual retiboplasty procedures were the most severe grade in the vapor trial whereas only around a quarter were the, uh, the same for the Vertos 4 trial. So this is what um, Brendan was talking about before about the age of the fracture. Um, and we see that we actually have that breakdown of one to three weeks and four to six weeks. And that was the cutoff for the duration of fracture. Now, we don't have that sort of exact breakdown for um, the uh, Veritas 4 trial. Uh, however, we do have like the number of days with back pain before procedure, which you can sort of use as an indicator of like, this might be around when this fracture originally started. And even like the average days uh, and the me uh, median number of days uh, for a patient that had the, uh, this fracture is on the longer end, like almost at the end of six weeks. Um, whereas patients of uh, in the vapor trial uh, like that, which just not have been included. So we're getting to another pull everywhere question. Um, we talked about differences in baseline and differences of uh, types of patients that were included uh, between these two trials. So what do you guys think? Is it okay to keep comparing the two trials despite these differences in baselines? And there's no right or wrong answer to this. It's just what do you feel knowing that you know, some of these points that we have brought up. And Dr. Kaplan, we'll be asking you for your expert opinion. You want me to weigh in on whether we should uh, be using them? Yes, please, in a little bit. I think the participants are okay. voting at this point. Okay. Yeah, I think we're good. We have predominantly yes. So Dr. Kaplan. So the answer is sort of, because this is about as good as we have. Um, you know, it's, it's about as close to apples to apples, even though I think a lot of the uh, 
criticism of, of Vertos is that their inclusion criteria was a lot, a little less strict and, and therefore may have skewed their data. But unfortunately we gotta use the tools that we have. So it's still okay to, to use them to compare. Thank you. So this is the results, pretty much the bird's eye view results of the two trials. So the left is the Vertos trial. Sorry, I should have labeled it. And the right is the vapor trial. So the, again, a quick reminder, Vertos is basically saying vertebroplasty is not useful. Vapor is saying that vertebroplasty is useful. So to take away from this, another thing that we found is that their way of quantifying if vertebroplasty was successful was different. So for Vertos, how they categorize it is if their pain score goes below more than 1.5. So if it started at five and went down to 3.5 or more, that would qualify as a success. However, in Vapor, instead of looking at the difference of the pain score, they counted any pain score lower than four to be a success in terms of vertebroplasty. So when they compared the experimental and the placebo group, they would compare the proportion of patients that report an NRS pain score less than four. So that's what you see on the right table is the percentage of patients reporting an NRS pain score of less than four for ver the vertebroplasty group and the placebo group in three days, 14 days, one month, three months, and six months. Uh, I think Hannah raised her hand. Do you have a quick question, comment? Yeah, I have a quick question for Dr. Kaplan. What is the clinical utility of a decrease in 1.5 in the pain scale? Like as a physician, what number would would actually affect the lives of patients? Is it 1.5? Maybe so, it's even 0.5. So it's funny you say that. I, I don't use a pain scale. Um, number one, I use something called a Roland Morris questionnaire, which is a 24 question uh, the survey, which essentially talks about how your back pain affects your life. And the data shows that if you answer, uh, I think it's, 19 of 24 affirmative, then you have severe debilitating back pain. So I definitely track the role in Morris. And uh, so I really don't use that. And, um, and really uh, a numerical rating of pain, I, I don't think has very much utility at all because, you know, when my kids were toddlers and they got a microscopic paper cut, it was like the world ended for them. And yet women will deliver babies without anesthesia. So pain is all relative. It's really just about, tell me what was going on with you. Tell me you had something happen and how your life has changed. And that's really, that's really what I do. And I tell them that they're gonna get about 70% pain relief from, the, from this and the rest of it is gonna be pain management and physical therapy because you're going to have to work on, once we fix the bone, you're going to have to deal with the, the hypertonicity of the paraspinal muscles, the decreased flexibility, the decreased muscle mass, and, and you're going to have to build all those things back up. And so it's going to can take months following a, a vertebral augmentation to actually get to a point where you feel your life is back in order. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I think Dr. Kaplan brings up a really, really good point is that post management, technically in the guidelines, they don't really mention physical therapy and so forth. To my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong. And the two trials didn't really mention the post manage the post vertebral plastic management. Um, so I think that's also a pretty important portion that should have been studied more extensively. Dr. Yeah, I make sure to plug plug patients all in. I give them uh, endocrinology and or rheumatology referrals to manage their bone health. So that's the long game as far as prevention of future fractures. Because even without a bone density score that's low, if you have a fall from a standing height or less and you break a bone, it probably means that you have osteoporosis. Um, 
so endocrinology, pain management, and physical therapy, like I make sure that everyone is set up with those three things in their post-op visit. So I did have a question about physical therapy. Is this something that physical therapists are aware of, like post vertebral plasty sort of, is there a regimen that uh, the patients have to go through? So like every other specialty, everyone has subspecialties. So I know being someone who has had disc herniations and foraminal narrowings and things like that and been to a bunch of physical therapy in the Northwell Stars Physical Therapy Network, there's actually therapists that specialize in spine. And so, you know, they, when the, the, our physical therapy people, when they screen patients, they'll try to place them with a specific therapist at the location that, of the patient's preference. Thank you. I think we're good to move on. So these are the results. The bottom two uh, in red boxes are from the vapor results. And the top one is the Vertos results. I mean, it's pretty clear that the Vertos results are showing that there's no difference between vertebral plasty and the sham uh, procedure, while the vapor results were striking in terms of how there is a huge decrease. The proportion of patients with NRS pain of less than four is significantly lower in uh, the placebo side and a lot higher in the vertebral plasty side. And the left one basically shows a little bit of a sub-analysis done by the vapor uh, trial team they saw that the thoracal lump, the vertebral plasty was most efficacious in the thoracal lumbar region. And the age of fracture less than three weeks, it was most efficient. So this is another question I have for Dr. Kaplan. From your experience, would you say the thoracal lumbar versus non-thoracal lumbar patients, it, was there a difference in results? And do you ever anecdotally see a uh, difference in the age of fracture in terms, in terms of the effectiveness of vertebral plasty? So that's my major criticism of, of Vertos, because even though that, that table, uh, hold on one second, that even though the table um, for the Vertos trial uh, showed three to six weeks, they actually were including people at like nine weeks, if you look at the actual methods. So, you know, there's this whole uh, thing about acute versus subacute fractures. And really what I make sure is that they have some advanced imaging that shows edema, um, whether it's bone scan with SPECT or MRI, but certainly you also see a difference in people's pain with early fractures, think of like when, if you've ever broken a bone, like an early fracture, just any motion and any touch causes them significant pain. As the fracture matures, the pain becomes less about, it's more of uh, less about any motion and any touch. It moves to like transition from standing to sitting, lying down and that type of thing and positional where if they're standing or sitting for a long time. So the quality and quantity changes as it evolves. And I find that the older fractures, it's le there's less pain reduction, but this is, I think more at that point, more of a muscular component. Um, and so I tell the people a lot of times of older fractures, I'm just fixing it so that the physical therapist will feel okay with working with you and that they're not worried that they're gonna break anything else or make something worse. But the acute fractures, those are the people who it's like you're a pastor in a Texas mega church and they roll up to the stage in a wheelchair, you touch their forehead and now they're doing cartwheels, you know, out the, out the, uh, down the aisle. And I had a woman who I did one on and she was like doing body weight squats in the, in the recovery room. And I just told her that she has to like chill out and take it easy. And she called, that was like a Thursday. And she called me on a Monday that she had uh, gone grocery shopping and slipped on ice and broke her hip. So, and I was like, you know, so uh, the, the newer fractures certainly, and then you have to think of that the thoracolumbar is more of like a, a mobility point. So the LS area and thoracolumbar are the big motion areas. So of course they're gonna be the ones that generate the most pain and therefore the most relief. 
Sounds good. Uh, we are running a little bit out of time, and I did want to open the floor to make sure that the participants can ask questions. I mean, we pretty much went through the journal club um, and went through the high yield points. So did anybody have any specific questions for Dr. Kaplan or any discussion points that you wanted to bring up? If not, we can continue on with the presentation. Um, I have a quick question about the complications of the extrav. Are there ways to prevent uh, extrav to di different spaces when you're doing a vertebral cross? So, so yes. So first things, I mean, just actually to get it out of the way, I rarely do classical vertebroplasties anymore. Um, we have a bunch of different techniques and they all fall under vertebral augmentation and because Now, now with the newer technology the first goal is to decrease pain and that's the the spot welding of the fracture fragments together the second goal is to restore height uh, and if you're in the thoracic vertebral body to correct angulation because the kyphosis can lead to a lot of downstream complications as far as restrictive lung disease and things like that and then the other one is to try to prevent the adjacent body uh, vertebral fractures by restoring uh, more natural and laid alignment. So there's a lot of different techniques out there now uh, that we use. But so as far as complications with extrav, number one, having really, really good imaging. Uh, that's, that's the first and foremost that's going to prevent severe complications. Number two, knowing your equipment and knowing how to depressurize your system. And then lastly, you can uh, use cements of different viscosities or use a, a, if you only have one cement available to you that hardens progressively over time, you can, you can wait until it's a little bit more viscous so it doesn't squirt out. Um, and then lastly, there are other techniques where you could put a balloon in called the eggshell technique and put it in a, so it hardens around the balloon and then fill in the area where the balloon is if you have like a cortical defect or something like that. You remove, once you've filled in the area where there's no defect where the balloon is, then, and that hardens, you deflate the balloon and now you're left with a cavity that you can fill. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan. Do we have any, I do have some questions prepared. So if anybody else on the floor doesn't have any questions, I can certainly, ask a couple. Uh, just a technical question, if I may. Uh, when you put in the needle or, or device in the broken uh, vertebrae, um, do the pieces move or what is the risk that they might like move out of place or how do you control that? That's a very good question. And in fact, the initial test case they, uh, in the burst fracture, there was a piece of that bone that was sticking into the canal and that's called retropulsion. And traditionally, uh, the, there are guidelines that say if you have like between 25 and 35% of the canal taken up by that bone, you probably shouldn't do it. Uh, at this point, I'm pretty confident that, it, that I can do these things okay, but, um, if I have a lot of that, I, I'll make sure that I have a neurosurgeon or a spine surgeon that, that's aware of the patient and has evaluated the patient. Uh, because if things do move, I want them to be able to be operated on and get a decompression. I've never had that happen. Um, I'll, and, and in fact, sometimes now with some of the new technologies where you can actually reduce the fracture, you can elevate the end plates the, the retropulse fragment that's, that's going backwards will snap back into place and you actually reduce it. Um, but yeah, I, you can't really, the, 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 since the cement is a liquid, it's gonna follow the path of least resistance. So it's more likely to extrav than push. Thank you. Yeah, so I also had a quick question. So I mentioned earlier in terms of the guidelines and the indications, it's vertebral plasty is mainly recommended for patients who already exhausted their medical and surgical management. So if there's all this evidence saying that the 
closer you intervene to the date of the fracture, the more effective it is. How do you think going forward, like, do you ever see vertebral vertebral plastic being the first uh, line treatment for these fractures? So there are, so there's two, there's a dip, there's, you have to think there's also, there's two different types of guidelines out there. There's evidence-based medical guidelines, and then there's CMS, Center for Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid services guidelines, which one frames the scientific community and the other one frames the insurance reimbursement. So the, the data doesn't really support anything, but the newest CMS guidelines from February of 2021 actually support early intervention in fractures. And essentially what you need to do is show that um, the patient has advanced imaging with, with an acute fracture, um, a physical exam, which matches their, uh, their, their advanced imaging and, uh, and, and basically some sort of debilitating pain or a progression of fracture over time. And, and then you're allowed to do it. And the definition of acute is not necessarily time, it's appearance on advanced imaging. So now there's, at least from the insurance standpoint, there's support for doing these because people recognize um, that bed rest and opioids, those lead to a lot of complications. Uh, you know, increased incidence of PE, dependence on opioids, constipation, you know, and, and constipation and, and is, is already a problem in the elderly. Um, in addition, if you're laying in bed for a long time, you get bone demineralization and muscle mass loss and cardiac deconditioning. So the longer you wait and someone's laid up, the less likely they're gonna to return to baseline functionality. And that has a huge downstream effect for both families and the medical community and, and, this, and the patient's overall quantity and quality of life. So from a money standpoint, I guess they recognize it's appropriate to do this. Thank you, is there anyone else? We do have one last point that we wanted to make before uh, we kind of conclude the session. So anybody have any other questions? I just had one question actually. Go for it. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, cause on, on, one of my, on my IR rotation, we saw a lot of kyphoplasties and and for that we they used oftentimes they used like osteocool ablation, and I was wondering if that had any uh, role in you know vertebroplasty or you know treating osteoporotic compression fractures or anything like that. In addition, to so that. it's interesting you say that. Um, so osteocool is really is really uh, just indicated for primary metastatic disease and hemangiomas. However, there is um, this company, Relevant Medical, which makes a radiofrequency ablation probe that ablates the basi vertebral uh, nerve, which is the nerve that comes out through the back wall of the, of the spinal co of, of the vertebral body and spreads throughout the body of it. And for people with certain type of chronic uh, vertebral body changes and chronic pain, there is now FDA indication for ablating that nerve. So sort of, yes, your answer is correct. There is a role, but, uh, but, but not using osteocool because that's specifically indicated for cancer treatment. But you're, you're onto something definitely in, in your question. All right. That's interesting. Thank you. Dr. Kaplan, I was wondering if you've ever had trouble getting an insurance company to, um, to cover a vertebroplasty for a patient? All the time. And, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. And, and uh, I've had, yeah, I've had to have a lot of these discussions. Um, but I, now that I, I'm really, really good with documentation and I use very specific language 
and I use the Roland Morris questionnaire. So I now have, you know, the story, the questionnaire to back it up, the advanced imaging and the physical exam. And, and, and so it's usually now iron, ironclad. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Um, Raj, do you mind just advancing a couple slides? Yep. So this is just something we found, like we were re really reading word, word by word of the Verto trial. So this is a trial that said vertebroplasty had no effect compared to placebo. In one of their ancillary analyses, I can just read it for you very quickly. A postdoc analysis showed that at 12 months follow-up, a significantly higher percentage of participants in the sham procedure group had a VAS score, so this is the pain score, of five or higher compared with participants in the vertebral plastic group. In other words, this is basically saying the same thing the vapor trial argued. So anyone with a VAS score of five or higher would be saying the pain is still persisting in the sham procedure group while the VAS score of four or below in the vertebral plastic group is statistically significantly different. So we were kind of confused why the authors of vertebral, the vert, Vertos trial didn't really mention anything other than this single paragraph. Um, I don't know if Dr. Kaplan has any insight on this, but we just thought it was really <laughs> interesting that they're basically saying the same thing. The Because it doesn't the support their conclusion it would throw a wrench in their whole system. But that being said, I do make a point of numbing the pedicles because I sit there and I said, oh, well, the sham procedure seemed to have worked and you know, lidocaine will, or bupivacaine will work within one, one to eight hours. So maybe it'll help the patient in the recovery room and things like that. So I definitely numb the periosteum because I figure it can't hurt. Yeah, so with that, on that note, I really wanted to thank the opportunity from the transnational uh, VIR group for letting us host. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan, for joining us. Really always fun to have you shed light on all these topics and share your expert opinion. Raj, do you have any other remarks? Nothing really, except I want to thank you as well for being a great person to work with on this th whole thing. And I think we really learned a lot and I hope all of you guys learned a lot. Thank you, Hannah. Awesome. Yep. Yeah, I just want to say thanks everyone for coming. We always have a blast learning together on a Thursday night because that's what we want to do. So thank you all for showing up and thank you, Dr. Kaplan, again, for being our advisor. Um, feel free to like us on Twitter so you can keep up. We've got uh, the next meeting um, already in the works. So stay tuned for the information on that. So thank you everyone and have a great night. And the video is also recorded and it'll be on our YouTube channel. So if, um, if you ever need to refer back to this journal club, it'll be on the YouTube channel. Thank you yes. so much, Dr. Kaplan. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Emmy. Have a nice night, everyone. Good night.